You look at some of the most manly cultures that we admire. The Spartans, they prayed. The Romans, they prayed. The American Cherokee, they prayed. You know, the Samurai, they prayed. Like all of these warrior cultures, every single one of them prayed. Prayer, even outside of a Christian context, has always been part of what it means to be a man because you're realizing that there's something higher than yourself and you're called to service of that thing. Many men are discouraged from praying. They think that's for weaklings, or, and after all, they have uh, cities to build and, and companies to build up and uh, all kinds of things to do, right? The only place in the universe where you can have a personal encounter with the living God is in the human heart. And so we need to make prayer a priority. Men do. You know, the Catechism says prayer is simply the raising of our mind to God. And we're called to have a deep, intimate, personal relationship with God. I couldn't just show up on game day with no practice and hope to be a Hall of Famer. The same is true in our spiritual life. We need to be disciplined with our prayer life. We need to invest time every day in prayer. Ultimately, prayer is, you are God and I am not, and I need you. I'm a sinner, I need a savior. I'm weak, I don't know what to do, I get discouraged, Lord. I need what you are so ready to just pour into me. Prayer is certainly the cornerstone of everything that we should be doing because it orients us to our Father in heaven. Men can integrate prayer into their daily lives in so many different ways, and I think this is really one of the, the critical elements for what it means to be a man. We are in need, so humility is the, is the foundation of prayer, and I believe that it's very masculine. A man can either walk in pride and say, I don't need anyone's help, or a man, which I believe is true masculinity, can say, I know who I am in relationship to my Heavenly Father and my King, and I am going to bow to Him, and I am going to carry on a conversation with Him and find out what does He want me to do. Prayer can really help a man in the midst of life's struggles and challenges and trials. Uh, you just think of the things that a man can deal with on a daily basis. He needs to have a rudder, and prayer really is that. We don't pray because we're good and because we're holy. Going to church and praying and submitting ourselves to the Lord, He makes us holy in the process of doing that. So it's, it's getting the order of things right and, and understanding what the source of holiness is. It's not our effort. And that's probably the biggest obstacle to the Lord um, making us into saints. As a father, modeling prayer is uh, really important. I don't necessarily pray only to set an example for my children, but Christ is inviting me into a personal relationship with Him and with His church. Because if we're just going through the motions, our kids know and they sense that. St. John Paul II, he actually said his father never spoke to him once about the priesthood, but he said, my home was my first seminary. And he said, after my mother's death, my father's life became one of constant prayer. He said, sometimes I would wake up at night and I'd look in my dad's room and I'd see him kneeling on the floor like he does in church, lost in prayer. Just that they see their father praying, I think is the most important witness. Not so much what we say, but who we are. Having family prayer is important just because it is a bedrock of the family. It's important that kids hear their father pray. It's important that they realize how much prayer is of importance in their lives. God is the author of marriage. And so to ask a question like, how does prayer strengthen marriage? It's like, well, you know, it's the very source of life. It's the very source of love. If I don't pray with her, then, you know, what am I doing? If you don't keep God at the center of your marriage, you have a good chance that you're gonna fail. It allows for an intimacy, a bond that's even deeper, and that's why marriage is it. Where there's prayer, they stay together so much longer. When we go to prayer, 
we surrender ourselves to the Lord. And what the Lord does in prayer is he sculpts us, he shapes us. He makes us who he wants us to be. The Catholic grade school, St. Rita's in Alexandria. I can never say I really had much of a prayer life. And then I ended up going to Bellarmine University in Louisville and playing basketball there. I was eligible for the draft for Vietnam. So they said, you have to report. My poor mother, she just saw nothing but body bags from guys coming back. 59,000 died. I thought to myself, you know, I have to learn how to pray because I could die over there. I just need to pray for God's help. And I saw a book on the rosary and I said, I'm going to read that and start praying it. And that's what I did. And I started getting regular at it, you know, even meditating on the mysteries. I was sent to a mechanized unit, like small little tanks. You really needed God's grace to help you get through this. You just can only take so much. You see guys stepping on landmines, getting blown up right in front of you. And then on April 21st, 1968, during the Tet Offensive, my six-man unit were attacked by a 100-man North Vietnamese unit. They were waiting for us, and there was only six of us. And so one of the communist soldiers shot an RPG at me. I was literally in a pool of blood. Instinctively, I just said, Mary, please help me. And I knew I was dying. And all the other guys had been killed, except one, he was a Polish-American from Chicago. And he heard me, he came over, and he said, Feeney, hold on. And he did all that he needed to do to prevent me from bleeding to death. And I said, if I ever get out of this alive, I'm gonna go thank Mary for saving my life. And so when I got out of the army, I, I just knew that God want, wanted me to be his mother's apostle. And then I started coaching and then teaching for many years to teach young people the value of prayer. I have six books that are in print right now, which is what led me to have a meeting with John Paul. John Paul II and I really bonded. He had an assassination attempt, and he lost a lot of blood. And in my story, you know, I lost a lot of blood, and I called upon Mary the same way he did. He was the most prayerful person I've ever seen in my life. He would literally pray hours every day. But he always said, my favorite prayer is the rosary. He said that the reason the kids aren't interested in the rosary in modern times, you're not teaching them to contemplate the mysteries. He stressed silence and meditation. That's why I'm encouraging you to do the John Paul II method. You would take the first decade and you'd say the name of the mystery, and then you would go to the scripture and you would read those verses. You reflect on that and you're quiet. Don't rush into the Our Father and the Hail Mary. It's having Jesus as your best friend and Mary as your mom. I was teaching at this Catholic high school in Arlington, and I was finding myself unable to finish the whole 40 minutes. My voice would just go out. So I went to a rheumatologist, just, and he said, you have Sjogren's syndrome. I said, I've never heard of that. He said, hardly anyone's heard of it. He said, it's an incurable disease. That's when the white blood cells attack the organs of your body. And there's no one who can help you. Mary's smile is focused on especially people who suffer. With her smile, she helps you fight your illness and to carry on. John Paul always said, put everything in Mary's hands and then let her give it to God. And so I've done that. I really don't know how much longer I have to live. I've given all my suffering to her. I said, Mom, this is a gift for you. Please give it to God. So that's what I'm doing. This is a very noisy world. God speaks to us in solitude. You see this in Christ, the many times that he would go off to the desert or go up to the mountains. The best growth in the spiritual life typically comes around from people who sought 
that silence and that solitude. Psalm 46, I think it is, be still and know that I'm God. We just have to be still. And that may mean sitting before a tabernacle, sitting before a monstrance, not think about any, anything. Just put yourself in the presence of God. I would strongly urge men to go to Eucharistic adoration. All you have to do is go there and be before God. I always leave with a sense of consolation. I always leave with a sense of peace. When you're discerning something in your life as a man, there is no better place to go than in the silence of Eucharistic adoration, not to discover what you want, but what is God's will for you. Part of that is also reading scripture, reading the, the lives of people who came before you, so in the saints, things like that. St. Jerome said ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ, so we should be reading particularly the Gospels and the Book of Acts, but all of the scriptures on a regular basis. Pope Benedict has said that the new springtime of the church will come about through a prayer for reading of the scriptures. And when we read the scriptures, it's not just learning more about Jesus, it's learning Jesus from our hearts, of who he really is, coming to know him as a man. Try to get to Mass on a regular basis as much as possible. There's something really profound and powerful in being able to encounter our Lord through the blessed sacrifice of the Mass. More than Visa or American Express, my rosary beads in my left hip, you know, my pocket are, are the key. And I, I look at life as spiritual warfare. They're beads for the battle. They're like spiritual bullets. And even if I can only get two or three Hail Marys out, I feel as though, you know, the devil's gonna duck, if not run. You know, many saints have called the rosary a weapon, but it's a weapon against sin and death and the devil. Now, it's not just this thing to sit there and just go through the beads and be bored is David and Goliath. What is the Goliath that has you so scared that you're afraid to live our lives as men? Is it drugs? Is it alcohol? Is it pornography? And when we begin to defeat the Goliaths in our life with the power of prayer, then we can start taking everything in our life to that next level. Because when your will and God's will are one, that's when you're truly free to be the man who God created and calls you to be. It's so essential, though, that we enter into that sacred silence. There's this in the silence of our hearts that we hear the voice of God. Just put yourself in the presence of God. Lord, I give you this day, and you just sit with it.